Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar. So my name is Jeroen Arts. I'm a customer technology advisor for Resolve Biosciences. And today I will be telling you more about what we do at Resolve Biosciences and what our technology is capable of. And you can see already in the background, a teaser image of how our data looks like. And each individual dot in this image basically is an individual transcript. So this is a, a cross section of a mouse brain zoomed in on the hippocampus. And um, this will already give you an idea of what type of data to expect from our technology. So first of all, I would like to start with the importance of spatial biology or spatial transcriptomics. And as you know, in, in the last couple of years, we've learned a lot about the cellular heterogeneity within tissues with technologies like single cell RNA-seq. So how this works is you take a tissue in this example, for example, a mouse brain, and you need to dissociate that tissue. So you need to uh, compartmentalize each individual cell, either in a droplet or in a well of a plate. And then you extract the uh, transcriptome and you do this by uh, generating library, libraries for sequencing. And this will give, uh, this will, uh, give you the uh, transcriptomic readout of each individual cell. And you may know the crude localization of each of these cells within a given tissue, but basically by dissociating that tissue, you actually lose the spatial context. So the power of spatial biology lies in the fact that you can actually extract the same transcriptomic information, but directly in the tissue section. So you will maintain the integrity of the tissue. You can interrogate each individual cell within that tissue and then analyze the transcriptome or the cell phenotypes within their native context. And this is very important if you think about how the environment can influence the cellular phenotype, being it in drug responses or in pathology. Um, and keeping that spatial dimension opens up a lot of new interesting uh, opportunities. And just to show what we do with our technology called molecular cartography, um, this is an example of a mouse brain. We typically use mouse brain as a benchmark, benchmarking tissue in spatial biology because we know the tissue very well. Um, and this is uh, a picture of the Allen Brain Atlas. On the left side, you see a coronal section of the mouse brain, the bright field image. And on the right side, the atlas depicting all the different um, areas. And we applied our molecular cartography technology on this tissue. And this is an overlaid picture of all the transcripts that we were able to detect from 100 genes that we included in this experiment. So with our technology, you can do 100, uh, you can detect transcripts originating from 100 genes per sample. And in this uh, case, we were able to uh, detect around 10 million individual molecules. So this tells you something about the data density, the amount of individual transcripts or data points that uh, you can capture with our technology. And I think this is um, maybe the most important slide. So what is under the hood of molecular cartography? How does it work? Well, it's an imaging based technology and it's based on combinatorial single molecule fish. So basically how it works is, is if you have a cryo section or a tissue section of 10 micrometers thick and you know which genes to target. So in our case, 100 genes, uh, we design transcript specific probes against all those um, uh, genes in, in your gene list. And basically what happens is all these transcript specific probes, tens of these probes, per target RNA will cover the RNA. And we have a proprietary mechanism um, to colorize, but also decolorize these transcript specific probes. And this is enabling us to detect uh, in a cyclical imaging fashion, all these different target RNAs. And the reason why it's important to do this in a cyclical imaging pattern is illustrated on the right. So in the way we design our probes, we know upfront that for all the transcripts that originate from gene A, so in this example, transcript A, we know that they will light up in the first round of imaging in one of the two channels we were imaging in. Um, and again, when we decolorize and recolorize the same sample, we know that in the second round of imaging, again, the same transcript, transcript A in this case, will light up in the same channel. 
and in round three in the other channel, et cetera, et cetera, for several rounds of imaging. And as you can see here that for each individual uh, transcript species, uh, we actually generate a unique barcode. And the barcode is basically the sequence in which you expect a signal uh, to be detected in one of the two channels we image in. And at the very end of all these imaging cycles, uh, you can then decode that barcode and annotate um, a transcript identifier to that spot in space. And this is a very elegant way to increase the multiplexing capacity of a traditional single molecule fish approach. approach. So this yields the same sensitivity as single molecule fish, but also is very specific um, and allows you for full digital quantification because you decode at the very end and you annotate or couple a transcript identifier to that unique spot in space. Specificity of our uh, technology is built into the chemistry. So using that barcoding scheme actually allows you to, with very high sensitivity, because it's built on the single molecule fish chemistry, but also with very high specificity, allow you to detect um, transcripts from 100 genes per sample. And more about the specificity, of course, we validated this against existing data. And then the mouse brain is a very elegant uh, uh, tissue for this because we know from a lot of data sources and earlier publications that in this case, for example, shown on top, that in the mouse cortex, we have these cortical layer markers that have very specific expression patterns. And as you can see in the top uh, row of panels, we were nicely able to recapitulate that with our technology. Again, a validation of our technology, and we know exactly for which genes, how we expect the ex expression pattern to uh, look like. So again, two big differences, I would say, with traditional in-situ hybridization or other technologies that use similar um, chemistries is that our signals are fully digitally quantifiable. So as opposed to traditional in-situ hybridization, you really capture the intensity of the signal as a way of um, um, quantifying differences between different genes. We do not do that. We can actually count each individual molecule. So you can do transcript counting. And also here in each individual panel, we just highlighted each individual gene and gave it a green color. But of course, each individual panel actually contains all the information uh, from 100 genes. You can just pick the gene that you like and visualize the, uh, the expression pattern. And in terms of uh, sensitivity, so typically we do uh, correlations with bulk RNA-seq. So this, in this example, we also show this um, um, as opposed to the um, uh, public data set from the Human Protein Atlas from a mouse brain um, compared to our count specifically for the cortical region. And we typically see very high correlations um, but I think the most important uh, comparison in spatial biology when it comes to sensitivity is also comparing that to single molecule fish, which is the gold standard of sens sensitive spatial uh, transcriptomic uh, technologies. So our chemistry is built upon the same principle. We use the principle of single molecule fish. You also see that if we interrogate the same sample on a gene by gene basis, we see the same amount of counts per cell. So this indicates indeed that we have a similar sensitivity uh, compared to single molecule fish. So going deeper into how our data looks, what you can do with it, um, and, and what the type of resolution is, etc. I want to go again to the same data set I showed earlier, so the mouse brain data set again. And for the, uh, the, the list of 100 genes that we included here, I'm just visualizing here 13 out, out of 100 genes, specifically the cortical layer markers. You can see this beautiful rainbow uh, image appearing. And this is again a validation of our technology where you would indeed expect all these markers to uh, be expressed and, and giving you this nice rainbow pattern. You can go a step further and really look into, instead of a layer resolution, you can look into a cellular resolution, including these cell type specific markers. And this is shown here. So only 35 out of 100 genes are, are displayed here where we uh, display um, the transcripts originating from glutamatergic neurons in red, GABAergic neurons in, in, in yellow, 
and also these uh, lesser abundant microglia in green astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. You can already see these yellow and, and green cells appearing, but it becomes very difficult to interpret uh, because the data density is so high. So our visual system is just not capable of making too much sense uh, out of this, but this does show you the density of the data and, and the amount of molecules that you capture in a single experiment. But what you can do is really zoom in and select just a couple of genes that you, you are interested in um, and looking at the different subsets of, of cells uh, that you're interested in. And this is an example of uh, visualizing the different subtypes of inhibitory neurons based on the marker genes that we included. So we have GAT1, parvalbumin, somatostatin, and VIP included here and zoomed in um, still the same experiment, the same data set, zoomed in on these individual uh, transcripts. And as you can see, we see these individual subtypes of, of cells appearing with these nice expression patterns, for example, in somatostatin, where you can even see these axons and dendrites uh, popping out of the cell body. So beautiful, beautiful images. But of course, you can dive deeper into that and really go into a single molecule resolution. So still, this is the same data set, just visualize this individual cell and individual molecules um, showing this uh, individual somatostatin transcripts in this uh, particular cell. And also showing you that we do capture the full 3D information in your 10 micrometer section. Um, and this also helps in increasing our specificity of spot calling in three-dimensional space. And each individual molecule, the resolution here is diffraction limited, so around 300 nanometers uh, per spot. So if you're interested, for example, in um, analyzing differences in the position, the subcellular position of, of uh, certain transcripts and, and comparing that within a given cell or between uh, 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 individual cells. This is, this is def definitely possible with our technology. This is the resolution that we provide um, for each experiment. So what else, what else can you do with this type of data? So uh, what we would like to do with this spatial data set is also extract a single cell uh, view on things. And the one way of doing that is uh, segmenting each individual cell, delineating each individual cell. And here we did it based on DAPI uh, the DAPI signal included in the data set. So we used an open source tool called QPath. So basically what we do is we take the center of the DAPI nucleus and we expand that selection with, in this case, eight micrometers. And we consider that as one, uh, one cell. Of course, it's not 100% accurate, definitely not in uh, brain tissue because these cell shapes are very complex, but it will give us an idea, a pseudo single cell view on, on the data. And you can get some in interesting insights uh, in this by doing that, for example, the amount of signals that are present in a given cell or the amount of genes that are actually expressed in a given cell. Of course, this is very dependent on the gene list and how you compile that gene list, but this can give you uh, very nice insights. But the nice thing what you can actually do is just extract that cell by gene matrix and really um, um, uh, export that data, import that in tools like Surat for UMAP clustering. And here, uh, from the data set I showed you, we clustered over 35,000 35, individual cells. And as you can see, we're able to, um, to uh, identify all the major cell types. We see some very nice clusters, and we can also generate these heat maps that uh, show you these uh, marker genes for each individual cluster. So this is very reminiscent of what we're used to from single cell RNA-seq experiments. But I think the major difference with spatial biology technologies and with molecular cartography is that you can always go back to the spatial dimension. You can always go back to the tissue in which you captured the data. And this is an animation showing you each individual cluster represented here in this UMAP plot, we are able to plot it uh, and visualize it on the tissue section. And then it becomes a very interesting, for example, in terms of drug treatment or pathology, you can actually visualize each individual cell type and see how these um, cell type change or, or maybe rare cell types or subtypes of, of cells, how they change according to drug treatment or uh, pathology. 
And this slide basically shows you the same thing where we plotted all the individual uh, uh, cell types. And what you can do is a simple analysis, just counting all individual cell types within your given sample. And this is of course a mouse brain. We know uh, approximately in a mouse brain how many microglia are in there or astrocytes. So we can do the same analysis here. And this actually recapitulates literature uh, to the dot almost. So which is a very nice, again, a very nice indication that even with a very crude um, cell segmentation based on DAPI, we're able to recapitulate uh, this data. But you can think of uh, other tissue types and other research cases where you would want to quantify the number of cells when you compare a knockout versus a wild type or other types of uh, questions like that. So quite a straightforward uh, quantification in this case. But I want to take the opportunity to illustrate you one of the use cases where I think spatial biology is, is, is very powerful. And this is the use case of Alzheimer's disease um, and specifically um, this was a project together with a major pharmaceutical company where we uh, were interested in looking into these disease associated microglia. So these are immune cells in the brain that are very closely related to the amyloid plaque pathology present in the Alzheimer condition. So what we basically did was compare wild type mice zoomed in on the cortex and comparing that with an Alzheimer mouse model that has these amyloid plaques present in the tissue. So here on the left, you can see the major cell types visualized um, in the different colors. You can see already big differences when comparing that to the diseased condition on the bottom, where you can see these microglia um, more closely associated with the amyloid plaques here in yellow, and then the neurons are uh, severely diminished in number. Things that we do expect in this Alzheimer mouse model. But one thing I want to highlight is we did um, um, label these amyloid plaques after we run the molecular cartography assay. So throughout the molecular cartography assay, the tissue remains intact. We do not use any clearing methods or protein ASK or any other method to remove protein content or DNA content. Uh, so everything remains intact and you can combine our technology with dye labeling, with immunohistochemistry or any other type of analysis that you have in mind to interrogate the different layers of information present in the same sample. So another way of um, visualizing or analyzing your data is really looking into, for example, all the genes that are, or transcripts that are enriched in either condition. And this is illustrated here. So again, in the Alzheimer condition, you see that all the, the enriched transcripts here are actually spatially located near the amyloid plaque. So indeed the pathology induces a lot of transcriptional changes things you might expect, maybe also based on single cell RNA-seq, but now you have evidence that in a spatial context, you actually see this happening. So again, a powerful illustration of why spatial um, biology is important. So in terms of quantification, what you can also do, and this is what we did with pharmaceutical companies, really looking on a single molecule, um, single transcript level and quantifying the number of disease associated uh, transcripts um, related to the, uh, the vicinity of the, the plaque. So you can draw concentric circles around the plaque and then quantify each individual uh, transcript. So the closer you get to the amyloid plaque, you see an increase in the transcript counts for these disease associated microglia, but also a decrease in the number of uh, neuronal uh, markers in this case. So you can actually do transcript counting in a spatial dimension and do these types of analysis. And what you can do again, and, and in this case, what we did was again, a, a DAPI based cell segmentation, uh, insert that in, in a UMAP plot, clustering all these individual cell populations and um, looking for the differences between the wild type condition and the Alzheimer uh, condition. And here you can see for the microglia specifically that indeed we were able to um, identify these two different populations. One is a wild type microglia, and the other one associated with the diseased condition. So this was already known from single cell RNA-seq. Uh, this was first published, I think in 2017. So very well known, but for the first time, we were able to insert the spatial component in there. 
So here is just the distance to the amyloid plaque, to the center of the amyloid plaque plotted on the same cell cluster. And then you can see that only or major in the major, uh, the major population that is affected here is indeed these microglia that the closer you get to the um, center of the amyloid plaque, the more you get into this uh, disease associated microglia subpopulation. And you can indeed quantify that again on a cellular basis. So you can just count the number of cells again in your tissue. You can see a drop in the glutamatergic neurons and increasing the microglia. And again, plotting that to the distance towards the center of the plaque, you can see an increase in these number of microglia and a decrease in these uh, glutamatergic neurons. So also on a cellular basis, you can actually use that data in a spatial context again. And then making it more visual, you can just plot all these individual um, cell types, cell populations um, on uh, both the wild type and the diseased uh, mouse cortex in this case, where you can see that in the diseased condition, you can indeed see this specific population popping up, the disease associated microglia, which are very closely related to the amyloid plaque. But interestingly, you can also see these reactive astrocytes that are present in the wild type condition in more of the border bordering the tissue. These are very dispersed in the diseased condition. So different populations do behave completely different uh, depending on the pathology present, which is of course another uh, nice spatially, um, uh, spatial insight that, that we have using uh, this type of technology. So also showing you some other applications. So still within the neurodegeneration Alzheimer condition uh, with the same uh, partner, we are analyzing human clinical post-mortem samples. So for control and BRAC stage uh, six Alzheimer patient samples. And as you can see, you can already see big differences in control and disease condition. Also in terms of the amount of neuronal transcripts present, the amount of microglia uh, present, et cetera. Just to show you that uh, beyond the mouse brain data, we also are generating human uh, brain data. And I want to um, start off with another poll question. So I showed you uh, a lot of examples already uh, of neuroscience. I will show you some other uh, applications as well, but I'm interested to hear from you, which fields do you see spatial biology being applied to? This can be your own research field or the, the research field that you think will be most impacted or, or, or most applicable to use uh, spatial biology technologies. So the poll should pop up now. So please um, fill in the answer um, and we can go over the results in a second. So I will be showing much more uh, other applications aside from neuroscience. Um, and I'm very interested to hear how many people we have online now that apart from neuroscience are also interested in applying this in other fields. So we're still waiting for the results to come in. Should be any minute now. I see we have increased numbers of the participants, so that's very nice to see. So again, welcome, welcome everyone. We have the poll results in, and it's I. Yeah, this is very interesting. So, twenty-seven percent of the people um, uh, would see neuroscience as being uh, the field where spatial biology can be applied to. But I think the majority of the people, slightly more, but equally. Uh, the, the percentage is equal, is oncology and immunology. And I would say immunology, I mean, immunology, you can incorporate that within oncology, immuno-oncology, or even in neuroscience. So I think immunology, for sure, a very important um, application in it, uh, application area in itself, but also in combination with oncology and neuroscience. And this is also what we see uh, in resolved biosciences, and in the spatial field in general, I think neuroscience, oncology, and immun immunology are really um, the fields where we see spatial biology uh, technologies being incorporated in, in a very rapid uh, uh, phase. A lot of interest in these fields, which uh, is, is, I think, very interesting to see how that will uh, increase the uh, research, research output and, and provide answers to, to a lot of research questions. So 4% uh, answer diagnostics and then 8% drug development, which makes also sense, I think. So diagnostics, 
uh, generally, I think the, the, the spatial technologies uh, um, in, let's say, the high multiplex spatial technologies, the sequencing-based spatial uh, technologies are not yet mature enough really to be adopted in the diagnostics fields. However, we see this happening in the coming years. So very powerful applications there as well. And of course, in drug development, this can really um, speed up drug development in certain phases um, to have that high multiplexed information in a single um, sample. So, okay, thanks. Thanks everyone for answering those uh, that question. So uh, let's move on. So as I mentioned, I talked about neuroscience up until now, but at Resolve Biosciences, we really uh, believe that there are a lot of different spatial biology questions across life sciences, across all the application fields. And here we show in, in a slide that, that we have optimized our technology in many different tissue types. And at Resolve Biosciences, we truly believe that not only in the typical mammalian sample types, let's say uh, if we think about uh, oncology and immunology, there's a lot of uh, need for these types of uh, um, tissue types, but I think we, uh, at Resolve, we go beyond that. And what we um, uh, really aim for is to have a very high tissue plexity in our assay. And well, what I mean by that is going beyond the mammalian tissues and really also interrogating or optimizing our technology to interrogate um, uh, more exotic samples, I would call them, for example, zebrafish, drosophila, but even uh, on the top right, you can see reptilian brain. We have data on pig kidney. We also have data on uh, plant samples. So this is the shoot apical nurse team of um, a maize sample. Um, so we see this uh, uh, within our company uh, growing. A lot of people contact us to, to um, uh, optimize our technology for, for uh, different samples. And I think this is very interesting. There are very interesting spatial questions happening in a lot of interesting uh, research areas um, that need other samples than I would say a human or a mouse sample in this case. So I think in Resolve Biosciences, we are very strong in this and we have dedicated teams that are uh, optimizing protocols uh, for the different uh, sample types. So from the tissue, tissue plexity that, that I showed you, I just want to highlight some of these tissues and some of these the, the data that we generated just to show what you can expect from these other tissue types, uh, aside from the mouse brain and human brain that I showed and uh, how the, it actually looks. So this is an example of the mouse liver. We have a lot of experience in, in liver samples. So in the sea of red here, which are actually all uh, hepatocytes, we can actually distinguish uh, more rare cell types like these Kupfer cells. These are immune cells and these hemopoietic uh, lineage uh, cell types here in blue. Um, so they're readily identifiable when you zoom in in the high resolution by these single molecules that are expressed. Um, and even, uh, let's say if we zoom in on the central vein here, you can see these endothelial cells nicely delineating the uh, central vein here in purple. And looking at the portal vein in the vicinity of the central vein, we're also uh, able to identify these cholangiocytes that actually produce the bile in the bile duct. So I think these are beautiful images illustrating the resolution, the sensitivity of our technology and being able to identify these uh, rare cell types within the liver. And what you can also do, and I think this is a beautiful image, it's, it's, it's more an art piece than science almost, is really um, again uh, doing cell segmentation based on DAPI and, and plotting all these different subtypes of hepatocytes that we identified by generating the uh, gene by cell matrix and um, um, visualizing all these um, subtypes of hepatocytes back onto the tissue. And then you can see even with a general cell type being the liver cell, the hepatocyte, with all these different subtypes of hepatocytes, you can actually see these nice gradients going from the central vein to the portal vein back again. You can actually see that it's a very structured tissue and, and uh, it, it's very nice to see with all the data that we captured from this tissue that we are able to recapitulate what was known from literature but also having all these subtypes displayed in one image is I think very beautiful and a nice application of uh, spatial biology. But going deeper into uh, liver, so uh, a recent preprint that is um, uh, uploaded to BioArchive from 
the group of uh, Charlotte Scott and Martin Gilliams uh, from VIB in Ghent in Belgium. Um, they are uh, absolute expert when it comes to liver biology, when it comes to single cell. Uh, they are part of, of generating the uh, liver cell atlas for both mouse and human. So they incorporated a lot of different technologies to extract uh, single nuclei, single cells using um, different uh, single cell uh, RNA seq technologies. They incorporated or uh, applied site seq as well, so using antibodies to get protein information. And using this methodology, they ended up with a very um, uh, detailed, very extensive uh, single cell RNA seq. Um, uh, atlas, let's say, of the uh, mouse liver, and they combine that, of course, atlasing, it needs a spatial component. They combine that with 10x Visium. Of course, um, the Visium technology has a very low resolution, but it can guide you in some ways to uh, at least um, curate a, a gene list of 100 genes that you can apply our technology onto to really interrogate the same tissue sample with a very high sensitive uh, high sensitivity and high resolution. And this is exactly what they did. So they used our technology to identify very rare cell types, these dendritic cell types that they were actually not able to um, detect using um, a very high plexed protein assay uh, as depicted here. So this is uh, another application where you see the need for um, spatial transcriptomics for one, but also high resolution, high sensitive spatial transcriptomics, as opposed, for example, to the 10x Visium, which is less sensitive and has a very low resolution. So um, the molecular cartography in this publication, and I advise you to check, check this publication, it has much more data on that. And it's a really nice uh, publication showcasing a lot of different spatial technologies, but it really shows you the importance of molecular cartography in the bigger picture, where you would need that sensitive readout and that high resolution readout. So going uh, further than liver, we also have data um, on oncology samples. And in this case, I, I'm showing you a, an example of breast cancer, human breast cancer, where we show two patient samples um, where I display here the expression patterns of 14 different genes. So just a small subset of a bigger, bigger uh, experiment. But you can already see very big differences between the two patients. So you can think about spatial biology and our technology as being used in uh, patient stratification, looking into the differences in the tumor microenvironment um, uh, between these uh, different patient samples. So again, to, just to illustrate that at Resolve, we are applying our technology to many different sample types. And you can have uh, many different insights and applications when looking into those different cell uh, sample types. And again, showing you another uh, preprint in BioArchive from a group in Austria that used our technology to study uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So I think uh, in the current day, uh, very important, of course, they applied our technology on different uh, cell cultures. So what they did was they incorporated uh, the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid uh, protein uh, transcripts as one of the targets and then incorporated a lot of uh, um, uh, antiviral response related pathway uh, genes and other immune related genes in their panel. And they utilized the, the strength of our high resolution, uh, subcellular resolution uh, technology. And they really looked into the spatial distribution within the given cell types. They could see some polarity um, differences between nuclear localized uh, signals versus cytoplasmic related uh, or localized signals, indicating for this particular um, um, gene also some active translation going on, probably, and also. Uh, checking the different uh, infection sites and correlating the signals uh, captured for the, the SARS-CoV-2 infection and correlating that to the entry factors that we know and being AC2 and others, and really seeing how that influenced the, the spread of the infection in the cell culture. And I think very nice uh, here illustrated as well is similar to what we do with the, or what we did with the Alzheimer uh, case, how to quantify certain uh, uh, signals here is again, drawing concentric circles around the primary infection sites. 
really to map the propagation of infection in these cell cultures. And they did that for on a single gene or a single transcript uh, basis, quantifying each individual dot. For all these immune related pathways, these antiviral pathways, and really uh, quantifying uh, how these pathways are involved in the propagation of the uh, infection, which I think is a very nice application of spatial biology in a cell culture environment. So our technology is also compatible with cell culture and we have uh, uh, separate protocols uh, for that. So just to summarize our technology, what it's capable of doing, um, it's validated uh, across many different species, many different tissue types, also in cell culture, as I showed you. We can do 100 genes uh, per sample simultaneously. We do capture the full 3D information in a given section. I will uh, show you a couple of slides on the analysis, which I think of course is very important. So we do have bioinformatics tools available for you. And one individual spot is one transcript. It allows you for full digital quantification. And we allow you to combine our technology with immunoyster chemistry or dye labeling. So the tissue remains intact throughout the assay. Uh, we also are in the process of deploying instruments in the field, which can hold up to 24 samples in a single run. And in terms of sensitivity, we do not use any enzymes or any other ways of ampli amplifying our uh, signal. And this is just to show you how to position our technology in the spatial technology landscape as opposed to other technologies. You can consider molecular cartography as the most um, sensitive and the highest resolution of the spatial transcriptomics technologies. Of course, this is a targeted technology. If we compare it to the untargeted um, sequencing based approaches, of course, these are powerful in the way that they can um, capture the transcriptomic information in an unbiased way. So non-targeted, of course, there are massive trade-offs for this. So when we look at the current uh, generation of the, the sequencing based approaches, they, they lack the resolution. So it's not single cell very often. And of course, the sensitivity is also an issue. So you tend to capture high expressed to mid expressed genes, but not the low expressed genes. So our technology is very sensitive, also capturing that low expressed, um, um, those low expressed uh, genes. And then we don't use any amplification, as I mentioned. So we use the single molecule fish based approach. If you compare that to, for example, technologies that use these um, rolling circle amplif amplification based methodologies, these are enzymatic reactions that you use in a tissue. It's not never 100% efficient, of course, and there you see much less signals being captured actually. So the capture efficiency or the, the detection sensitivity in your tissue is, is much less as opposed to um, adhering to the single molecule fish approach as we do at Resolve Biosciences. So this is... Uh, a third question we want to ask you. So which capability do you think is most important in spatial biology? So I think this is a very important question um, in how to think about our technology development. We are actively uh, developing our technology further to increase the multiplexing capacity, to increase the throughput, et cetera, et cetera. But of course we would want to know from you what you think is the most important parameter of uh, all these parameters to include or, or make the technology the most useful for your applications. Of course, I didn't include the uh, sixth option, which would say all of the above, because that would be ideal. That, that would be the, the best technology in the universe, I would say. But of course, there are trade-offs with, uh, with any of these features. So it would be very interesting to hear which is the most important feature for your applications. Okay, great. That was quite a quick turnover. So we already have the results. So um, the majority of you, so 50% of the attendees said resolution is the most important for the application. So, and I think that's, yeah, that's a very interesting answer, right? So I just uh, presented you a very high resolution, subcellular resolution technology. So molecular cartography, I think is a, is a great technology, uh, or actually I would say the best technology uh, that is available now in terms of resolution. 
terms of multiplexing, uh, this is the second answer, so 22%. So multiplexing, uh, of course, is very um, powerful for many applications. So in the current state of our technology, we are able to do 100 genes per sample, but we do have a roadmap where we are increasing the capacity of our multiplexing uh, to uh, between 200 to 300 uh, targets uh, per, per sample. And I think that is currently a sweet spot where you can include a lot of different cell type markers and a lot of different genes that you gain out of other technologies like single cell RNA-seq and that will give you a lot of flexibility to to inter interrogate your sample with with two to three hundred genes but of course with a hundred genes uh, available today you can already already do a lot and I see a lot of customers um, sometimes having problems filling up even the hundred genes so it really depends on what angle you uh, come from. And then 17% of uh, you uh, voted for field of view. Of course, field of view is very important. You want to um, interrogate as much of the sample as possible. I see this very valuable when you are looking into very rare cell types. You would like to capture as many of those very rare cells as possible in a given sample. And then last but not least, uh, some of you voted for throughput and sensitivity, both very important features. I think in terms of sensitivity, um, I actually would have expected to, this to be a bit higher up the ranking because when you look at single cell RNA-seq, for example, or uh, the uh, sequencing-based spatial technology, so single cell RNA-seq, uh, I would say when you compare that to the gold standard of single molecule fish, if we talk in terms of capture efficiency, how many molecules do you capture? from a given cell that are actually present in the cell. Single cell RNA-seq in the best experiments that you can do is only about 30% or even less of the transcripts that you capture. So there's a lot of dropouts there and this has to do with many different processes in the protocol. But I think in the spatial biology uh, era where we're at now, you have access to technologies like single molecule fish and the highly multiplexed versions of that like molecular cartography that allow you to actually increase that sensitivity by a lot. So I think that can yield very interesting insights in how to determine the different phenotypes and, and how to distinguish these uh, transcriptional signatures on, on a single molecule basis. So, okay, um, thanks a lot for your answers. Very insightful. Um, I will move on with the presentation. And so I want to talk a little bit very briefly about how to access uh, our molecular cartography technology. So if you would like to access our technology uh, today, we have an end-to-end -end service in place where if you have your uh, gene list uh, of 100 genes, what we do is we order or we synthesize the probes. And so you order the probes, we synthesize the probes, and we send you these glass slides. You have a picture here. We send you these glass slides where you can um, uh, posi position your sections onto the glass slides uh, and you ship them back and we do everything else. So we run the full molecular cartography essay. Uh, we uh, provide you with all the tools necessary and all the data necessary for you to analyze and interpret uh, your data. But we also provide you with uh, a full data report and we organize a, a, a meeting a meeting with you to go over all uh, the data in, in, in a joint session and answer all your questions. And we also provide support uh, when it comes to data analysis. On the other hand, I mentioned that we are in the process of deploying instruments in the field, and this is actually how it looks. So we have an imager coupled to a robotic arm, which um, is coupled to a, 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 a liquid handler. So just to dispense all the different liquids and then automate the imaging cycle. So this is a completely automated uh, workflow, hands-off workflow that can actually hold up uh, hold uh, three of these glass lights. So each individual glass light has eight positions. So in total, you can actually run 24 samples in a given run. And this is um, showing you in, in more in the context of sample preparation. So typically what we do is cryo sections. We also have some experience with FFPE. So it, it is compatible with, with paraffin uh, embedding. Uh, but this is just to show you how our uh, sample preparation, preparation looks like. So these are the glass lights that we provide you. They're much 
thinner than a normal glass slide, but for the rest are the same dimensions, which has the benefit of also you taking the glass slide out and putting it into a conventional microscope for, I don't know, additional downstream uh, essays that you would like to do. But this is uh, how you would position the sections on the glass slide. You heat it up with your finger. And so everything remains frozen in a cryostat and then actually freezes back onto the glass slide. So these are excerpts from sample preparation videos that we also provide you with. So I myself as a customer technology advisor uh, can help you from A to Z throughout your experiment, uh, uh, helping you out with our, all the technology uh, related questions, sample preparation uh, related questions. And we do have a lot of expertise and information to share with you to make your experiment a, a success. So more about data analysis. I think this is a very important topic. So what we do, how we approach it, uh, this is the type of data that you receive from us or what is generated in the uh, instrument. So for each individual dot, each individual data point, you actually have an X, Y, Z coordinate and a transcript identifier. So the results you get are basically a massive count table. So if you have 1 million individual uh, signals captured in your data, you will have a count matrix with 1 million individual rows. Uh, attached to each row is a transcript identifier. And we do provide you with DAPI images. We do provide you with the raw images, which is basically uh, maximum projection images, uh, images of a single channel. And you can use these images to overlay these results. And the way to do that is we uh, provide you uh, with an ImageJ plugin, which is called Polylux. And we chose for ImageJ because it's a very open tool. A lot of uh, labs use this. A lot of uh, people in the research community use this tool because it's very open, very powerful, very compatible with many other tools you might have already in place. And this is just a screenshot of view on how it looks. So it's fully integrated as a plugin into image J. So basically you can load in that results file and that will display all the genes that you have uh, uh, included in your experiment. You can select all those genes, you can give it colors, and then you can basically display all those individual transcripts onto your tissue section. And then you can use the power of image J to delineate regions, uh, select individual cells, or you can actually import um, cell segmentation regions from tools like QPOT, for example, you can import that and then export that data back in a uh, gene to cell matrix and import that into tools like uh, Surat, or you can use the um, count table and directly insert that in other pipelines uh, you may have already in place. So we designed it to be uh, very compatible, very open. We uh, also have tutorials available on this. And of course, as I mentioned, we also do offer support in analyzing uh, your data. And on top of that, we also um, uh, provide you with a tool called Recognize, which is a web-based visualization tool. It also has integrated uh, cell clustering. So this is still a tool in development, but this is basically how it looks. So it's really, uh, uh, it's it's very nice to use. It's, it's look, it really looks beautiful, has a nice user interface. It allows you to really fly through your tissue, through your data in 3D. It's, uh, again, allows you to visualize all the different transcripts of all the genes included with a nice uh, user interface. You can measure things, select regions, etc. You can import again, these different uh, cell segmented regions. Um, and then it basically has Surat running in the background where you can then um, immediately generate these uh, single cell clusters, these, these UMAP plots. Um, and these are 3D UMAP plots. So basically what you can do is select each individual cluster in 3D and then uh, map that back onto the tissue. So this is um, what we also offer on top of the um, more local um, in-depth uh, image shape plugin that we also provide. And we have a final question to, um, to end this session. So it's actually a trivia question. So the first person to uh, put the right answer in the chat will win a small gift. So the question is from which species does this sample originate? So the sample here is displayed on the right. And I can give you one small tip. It's not really a new species of small human or anything, although it looks a bit funny, I would say. But what species is this tissue type from? 
still waiting for some answers. Maybe it's a difficult one, I'm not sure. I can say this is neuroscience related. It's not chimpanzee, it's not mouse. Aha, I think we do have a winner. Uh, so Hannes Arnold, so thanks a lot for your answer. It's indeed zebrafish. So it's part of the zebrafish brain cut in, um, uh, in a top-down angle. So Hannes, we will contact you after the webinar. So congratulations with your answer. And this brings me uh, right to the end of our uh, webinar. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining. So um, I will take up for the time we have left. I'm not sure how much time we have left for the uh, questions. So I'm happy to answer uh, all your questions. Um, and thanks again for joining. If you uh, have additional questions after this webinar, after this session, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, you can contact me on the uh, email displayed here. So let me check. I'm not sure what time it is. Okay, we still have time for questions. Let me see. So we do have uh, some questions in the Q&A. So Olufemi, if I pronounce that correctly, uh, asked a question, is your cartography technology applicable to formalin fixed tissue sections? So um, I, I partly answered maybe this already in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the webinar I gave. So um, we did some uh, initial tests with uh, FFPE tissues. So one of the tissues I actually showed you were the plant tissues, the maize shoot apical meristem. That was actually done with FFPE samples. So the chemistry is compatible with FFPE. Uh, so that's absolutely no problem, I would say. Of course, when we go into the topic of FFPE, we often go into the topic of uh, archived samples, um, these FFPE samples that are stored for 20 years, maybe longer. And there, uh, of course, we need to take into account the uh, RNA integrity. So as I mentioned, our technology needs to have a certain part of the RNA intact to uh, cover the uh, transcript specific probes. So depending on the uh, RNA integrity, our technology will work or, or, uh, or not. And we are in the process of figuring out how can we correlate that with RNA integrity values like a RIN score or other metrics. So I would say it's compatible, but depending on the RNA integrity. So um, Milat has two questions, so two quick questions. Could molecular cartography be used to distinguish human from mouse cells in chimeric tissue? Um, yes, that is possible, of course, depending on uh, how we design the probes and what the overlap would be in the sequences and how um, much of the homology is present there, but it is definitely possible. And we did some uh, experiments with um, with human and mel a mouse uh, cell lines and, and checking, uh, let's say, uh, where we see duplicates, um, just to check also the specificity of our technology. So that, that, that's definitely possible. Um, so if you're interested in that, please reach out to us and we can have a more in-depth discussion about that, how to uh, approach that. Um, could this be used to identify and distinguish viral exogenous gene expression in lengthy viral barcoding experiments of a given solid tissue. That's a lot of information in a, in a given uh, um, question. Um, but we are able to identify, let's say, certain uh, transcripts originating from viruses. Um, I, I showed you that uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 example. We also have examples of, for example, customers doing mRNA vaccines, uh, delivering certain cargo or sequences through a, a viral uh, load. Um, that is also possible. If we know the sequences, we can design custom uh, probe sets against those sequences. So I would say that's, that's also definitely a possibility. So very interesting questions. I'm really interested to hear more about your research questions. Um, I also see Yun asked a quick question, how to get the Z-axis information. Uh, so we do provide you when we deliver data, we are, are able to provide you with the Z-axis information. So I mentioned that standard, we provide you with the DAPI images, we provide you with the raw image of one channel. These are both maximum projection images. So that's more, um, let's say the standard uh, data delivery we do in the end-to-end -end service, but we can also, um, provide you with all the individual Z stacks for you to uh, map these 3D images and really look into um, differences in the three dimensions. So that is definitely possible. 
we have a bioinformatics team uh, to be able to support you in how to compile that data and, and make it uh, um, interpretable, interpretable for your research. Um, Ennis, Ennis asked the question, what is the re resolution of this technology? Five micrometers, 20 micrometers. Um, it's actually much higher than that, much better than that. Our resolution is 300 nanometers. So it's subcellular single molecule diffraction limited. So you can actually detect individual molecules as opposed to, for example, uh, other technologies, the sequencing based technologies out there have uh, 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 multicellular resolution. So our technology is targeted, but super high resolution, single molecule. Okay, let me check if I can find some more question. So um, T1 Zhang, if I pronounce that correctly, asks a very interesting question. So how do you, you compare your technology with 10X Genomics Visium? So this actually comes back to the previous question. So I would say 10X Genomics Visium is a powerful technology if you would need unbiased um, spatial interrogation of your technology in a spatial manner. Of course, there are other technologies with a better resolution, for example, StereoSeq, which is being developed by BGI. But generally, I would say 10X Genomics Visium compared to our technology, which are maybe two different parts of this same spatial technology landscape. They are sequencing based, we are imaging based. Uh, I would say we have a much higher sensitivity, a much higher resolution. Um, and those can be, those can mean different applications, um, but those are the main differences. On the other hand, I would say 10X Genomics Visium can um, have a bigger field of view in terms of throughput. They can process maybe um, more samples at a given time because it's sequencing based. You can just do library prep and you sequence it as opposed to imaging based technologies in general, including our technology, where we are really zooming in on, on certain parts of the tissue and capturing that high resolution, high sensitive, uh, high sensitive data. So that's uh, also some differences there, but I would say there are compatible. Um, and I think many people are even switching directly from single cell RNA-seq directly to a targeted high resolution, high sensitive technology like molecular cartography, because once you know your single cell RNA-seq data, you know your genes of interest, you know your cell types that you want to interrogate, the cell type markers that you want to include, and you don't really need always an untargeted technology like 10X Visium, because also the resolution there for many applications, I'm thinking about neuroscience, is just not good enough to um, really um, gain new knowledge about the location of these different individual cell types. I would then rather go for a very high resolution essay like um, molecular cartography. Um, I'm just scrolling down to more recent questions. Uh, there will be a recording of the webinar, uh, Rhea. So that's an easy uh, question to answer. Um, Nithi um, asks, can this technique be performed in organoids? Um, yes, it can. We have many projects ongoing uh, with organoids. So there's a lot of interest in the spatial community to do this on organoids. And we do have uh, optimized protocols for this. I, I think even on one of my slides, I showed you one example of a human, uh, human organoid. Uh, so it's definitely possible. So Leonardo asks about the sequential observations and the temporal resolution. So this is actually a good question maybe also easy to answer, we do not have temporal resolution. Um, so we do have tissue sections, we fix them before proceeding with the hybridization cycles, the imaging cycles. So it's locked in time. We don't have a temporal uh, way of doing that. If you're interested in temporal dynamics, I would say um, um, harvest your tissues at different time points. And with our um, uh, sample carrier or glass slides, you can actually interrogate many different time points and reconstruct the temporal dimension in such a way. I think true spatial transcriptomics, high multiplexed with temporal resolution is the next big thing. Um, this will be spatial technology 2.0. We're not there yet. It's also very difficult um, uh, to see when this would be developed, but I think that is the next big thing in spatial biology. 
Um, Stefan is asking a question, what is the throughput capability of this technology? Um, the throughput um, depends on how many samples and how many genes that you are detecting. Of course, uh, there's always a trade-off, especially with um, these imaging-based technologies. We're capturing very high resolution data. So the more genes you want to uh, include in your essay, the lower the throughput and uh, the, the higher the resolution, also the lower the throughput. But we chose at Resolve in at least our end-to-end -end service model to have the high sensitive, high resolution capability for eight individual samples on a given glass slide. And for eight samples on a glass slide, this typically takes between three to five days to complete from start of the experiment all the way to having the primary analysis, which means the decoding of all the signals to have the data delivered in your hands. And the question is, is higher throughput in micro titer plates conceivable? That's actually a quite unique question. It depends on what the experimental setup would be in your case, but we do have, so the way it works is we have those eight samples on the uh, glass slide and we, um, we attach a well-based system on those glass slides uh, where we then put in the different liquids. So we are hybridizing all the uh, targets within, within a given um, uh, tissue section or, or multiple tissue sections if you can uh, place them in, in one of these capture areas where you place a tissue section. Um, and that is the way our system um, is designed, how it works, where a liquid handler just um, uh, replaces the liquids, uh, the colorization, decolorization reagents, etc. So having a mic micro titer plate in there is not really, I would say, compatible with our technology. But what is compatible is really after everything is done, if the entire data is generated in our platform, you can still take that glass light out and use it for any other type of analysis, either just in the lab or in the, in, uh, under a microscope doing other types of assays. So the format of the glass light um, is the same as a standard superfrost light, which is actually also different from other companies that use more circular slides or very custom-made slides, with it, which is not always that experimental friendly, I would say. So I don't see any other questions and I think our time is also up. So it's all already over time. So thank you again, everyone, uh, for all the nice questions, the nice interactions with the polls. It was a pleasure to give this uh, presentation. If you have any additional questions, don't hesitate to contact us either directly through my email um, or find more information on our website 